that we've covered interpolation in the first couple of sections of chapter 3. We're ready to move on to curve fitting. Remember that one of the differences between interpolation and curve fitting is assumptions on the data itself. With curve fitting, we're going to assume there is noise, there is air, there is air in the data, where we did not in interpolation. The title of section 4, chapter 3, is on least squares fitting, so we're going to use a particular technique called a least squares fit to basically fit a smooth curve through our XY data points. So again, we're on a two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system with data. We'll assume the data is a form X, I, Y, I. I indexes from zero to N. So we have N plus one data points that we have before. But now we're not trying to interpolate to the data. We're just trying to get sort of a representation of a, a single function that fits that data as best as you possibly could, could so that you could use that function for example to you know to estimate missing values or estimate predictions for the future and things like that. We're going to assume that there are no errors in the x-coordinates. We're going to assume that the errors in this data lie solely on the y-coordinates you know, with, with the data so that there will be errors there. So the goal of a least squares fitting is to minimize a function of m plus 1 variables. So the variables will be defined a0 through am. And, in, and we're minimizing this s function as a, as a function of those m parameters such that it's equivalent to a representation of the sum of the squares of the errors of our fitting function. So f is the function we're trying to fit to the data. So the idea is that when we plug in an xi into our function, it, you know, it won't be exactly yi. We want it to be fairly close to it. So this representation on the right-hand side here is a representation of all the errors. It's the, it's the error at every single one of your xi coordinates, of your x-coordinates. So as i indexes from 0 to n, we're looking at trying to minimize the sum of the squares of all the errors. And graphically, I'll illustrate that in, in, a, in, in, a, in a slide to come. But that's the concept of least squares. Fit is to minimize the sum of the squares of the errors. Now just like in Calculus 1, where if you had a function of one variable and your goal was to minimize or maximize it, you would compute a derivative of set equal to zero and then solve for those particular values of x, if that was the independent variable. Of the function. Do the same thing here in a function of many variables, in this case m plus 1 variables to be specific. Because it's a multi-valued function we have to um, compute partial derivatives here and we would compute the partial derivative of every single design variable, in this case every single a sub k. Set that at equal to zero and figure out what the a's would have to be for that to be minimized. Because again we're constructing in a way that this s function minimizes those errors between our smooth function that we're trying to fit and the data itself. By definition, we would call that difference at every point xi r sub i, or the residual. And again, all it does is represent the difference or the discrepancy in what the function's producing at xi versus the data that we had at, uh, that we were given, yi. So it's the discrepancy between the ith data point and the fitting function at xi. That will be r sub i, the ith residual. So you have some choices here to decide, you know, you can decide how you, you know, how you want to create a fitting function. Um, one way is to, con is to construct it as a linear combination of, of other functions or individual functions called fj of x. So you could define the fitting function this way, that you know, it would be of the form a0 f0 of x plus a1 f1 of x, all the way up through, summing up through a m f m of x. And again, the a's are the parameters to the design function, that s function that we had here before. So one way that you could, uh, one possible construction that seems natural is to choose the individual f sub j functions as just succeeding monomial terms of, that would, could be used to construct polynomials. For example, f0 of x could be 1, f1 of x could be x, f2 of x could be x squared, uh, 
f3 of x would be x cubed, and so forth, so on. So every f function is just that corresponding power of x that matches its index. So how then do we visualize this fit of this fitting function to the data? So in the next slide, I've shown graphically, again, we're looking at data that lies in the two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system. So we have x coordinates and y coordinates. And what I'm showing you here is just three data points indicated here in red. And this is our fitting function f, which is an attempt to fit to that data. So clearly the function doesn't go through the data, so we can see immediately this is not interpolation. We're not making an attempt to interpolate the data. And this fitting function looks actually fairly linear, doesn't it? I mean, there's no way you could get a linear function to interpolate to those three data points, right? We could do a quadratic, but we couldn't get a linear. They're not collinear. So in this case, it makes sense if we're trying to do a linear fitting function to, to use this kind of an approach. And so the errors that we really have here are these kinds of errors. So the function missed the, the y-coordinate by that much there, and it missed the y-coordinate you know, by this much here. And so I'm just sort of sketching in um, the different errors that you would have. And again, there would be this error here. Um, for that function. So, uh, so you can see that, you know, there's, we're trying to minimize these errors at all the data points. That's the goal. We're trying to get as possible, you know, the best possible fit that we could have, right? And the spread of the data about the fitting function, in other words, all these little errors that I'm indicating here, you can quantify them as, in terms of a standard deviation. Um, by looking at whatever the, the, the uh, design function s, whatever the sum of the squares of the errors, divided by m minus m, the difference between the number of design parameters and the number of, uh, and one less than the number of data points. Um, that's one way of representing a, a single value to represent all the errors. So you would, you know, that's just a, one technique. Um, again, using the standard definition. So S, this, the S here really defines what we would call the spread. In other words, um, that would be, you know, looking at all the individual, summing up all these individual differences between the fitting function and the data. It's divide by n minus n, n minus m, and then take the square root, and you would get a value. So again, the spread would be compute all these differences, all these errors, between the data and the function, sum all of those up, divide by m minus m, and then take the square root. One way we can measure the fit. Now, obviously, there's a special case here. If the, if the m, the number of design parameters used to construct the fitting um, function is equal to m, in that particular case, there's actually no curve fitting, okay? In other words, what can you say about this case? In that particular case, you would basically be doing an, an interpolation. Okay, so that would be an interpolation. In other words, there would be no error. In that case, the standard deviation would be zero. Okay, um, meaning that you know, for example, if 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 I only had two data points here, if we were to you know, we were to remove this data point here. Um, get that out of the way there. If we just had this data point there out of the, uh, having little problems with the select there, but I think you get the idea. If we just remove that data point there, and I only had two points, these two red points, and I wanted the best curve fit, well then obviously we could fit a straight line through those two points. We would interpolate them perfectly, and there would absolutely be no error in terms of the spread that we're talking about. So what's, what we're saying is that we have, uh, you know, if, if, we'll, if we're looking at a fit with, you know, of, of a lower degree polynomial for a lot of data, we'll obviously have errors. But in this case, you know, if, if the degree of the polynomial that we're, if we're building a polynomial to fit the data, and it's of 
its degree is one less than number of data points, then it's, there's not going to be any error. It's, you're going to be able to interpolate it um, perfectly. So if m is equal to n, you're basically doing an interpolation problem without any spread errors at all. So let's look at how you can construct uh, using a least squares fit um, a finite function. We're going to look at the case where m is equal to 1. Now when m is equal to 1, that means the, uh, the fitting function s only has two variables, in this case uh, a and b. Again, now originally we were, in, we were representing it as a0, a1, a2, but in this case we'll just use two, we'll call them a and b, but there's only two. Geometrically, what it means is we're trying to fit a function of the form a plus ba, a plus bx to the data. Well, I think you recognize that this is basically just the formula for a straight line. Right? And so, hence, this type of least squares fit is also called linear regression. So if you were to take a statistics class, and maybe you've had a statistics class, then you would remember a term perhaps called linear regression, and that is you're trying to take two-dimensional data and trying to fit a straight line to it, the best possible straight line that you could. And that's exactly what we're talking about. So in this case, the minimization of the errors, again, is described by minimizing these errors because we're choosing a particular form for f now. If it's of the form a plus bx, then if we substituted that expression for f here, then now what we're saying is that we're trying to minimize this particular set of errors, yi minus a minus bxi at every single data point um, that we have, indexed to, uh, where the i is indexed from 0 to n. But you know, the design, we only have two parameters here, a and b, to, to use to minimize those errors. That's the issue. Well, as we said earlier, to be able to figure out exactly how to accomplish that minimization and to figure out what A and B would have to be, because that's the goal here, right? If we're trying to fit this line to the data and we assume the function, the fitting function, which is a line, is the form A plus BX, we're trying to find A and B so that we minimize those errors. So we'll take the partial of S with respect to A and we'll take the partial of S with respect to B. Again, if we go back to the previous slide, this is what we're assuming, that the function s of ab has this particular form. Okay? We're assuming that it, has, uh, that it has this particular form um, right here. Okay? So we're going to take the partial of this, express, this summation there with respect to a, and a partial with respect to b, set it equal to 0, and see if we can figure out what a and b have to be. If we do, then we have found the best li the line that fits that data the best. That's the goal. So let's move back to the previous slide. Save you the time and effort by computing the partial. Well, the partial derivative of this uh, inside the summation here with respect to a is given by what you have there inside the brackets. Same thing for what you have for b with that. You set it equal to zero. All right, and we want to. You know, use some algebra to clean this up a little bit and see if we can figure out what kind of constraints we really have on A and B. Again, we're just computing the partial derivative of the terms inside the summations. Well, it turns out if you define, let's say, the mean of X uh, in this way is 1 over N plus 1 times the sum of summing up all of those x of i's, and that's the average that you expect. And then we do the same thing for y bar. So x bar and y bar are just the respective means of the x coordinates to the y coordinate. So you're getting the mean x coordinate and the mean y coordinate. And divide the equations that we had for those representations of the partials of uh, s with respect to a and b set to zero. Divide by 2n plus 1, and what we get are these equations right here. So just with a little uh, recognition of that we're, we have some representations of constraints using x bar and y bar, then what we would get is first of all that a plus x bar b has to be equal to y bar, 
and also this equation down here involving uh, an effect of the sum of the squares of the x of i terms. This effect is the sort of the average, average, sum, uh, average square term added to the mean times a, that times b should be equal to the right hand side there. Okay. So these are equations. This is just another way of rewriting those equations involving the partial derivatives, but making a, 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 a variable substitution with any time you have the sum of xi over n plus 1 or the sum of y over n plus 1. And hence we get these new representations using the means, x bar and y bar. So with a little algebra, if it's obviously it's it's not you know not trivial, but with a little algebra, you can solve those equations. You can extract a and b, and uh, what you can come up with is uh, this representation that a is equal to your mean y uh, coordinate minus your mean x coordinate times b, where b is given this particular form. Okay. B is the sum of yi's multiplied by the difference between each x coordinate and its and its the x mean, the mean x coordinate, and then that's normalized by um, almost equivalent sum where you have xi times its difference with the mean. Okay. So keep in mind that the x of i's are all given. You can easily compute x bar then, the mean, if you have all those. The y i's are given. That was the original data. And it's very easy to compute their mean. So we fully ex uh, expressed what those two design parameters, a and b, which are used to define a linear fitting function, have to be. So now we can we know how to fit a linear function to our xi, yi data. No matter what the data is, this is the best line that fits it. So that's going to be generic for any kind of data you give it. So we've produced a technique, a least squares fit, that will work for any data set that you would give it of the form xi, yi. This tells you exactly how to compute the two parameters a and b to define that line. On the next slide, we're going to generalize this process of uh, fitting um, functions by what we'll call fitting linear forms, where before what we just did just uh, in previous slides is we were trying to fit a straight line. So um, the two parameters a and b, a was multiplied basically against a function, a subfunction, say one, and the other one, b, was multiplied times a function times x. So we could generalize that representation of our fitting function in this way, so that we can assume it is some linear combination of other subfunctions. So what we had before for the previous one is that we were just doing f of x, let's say equals a zero times one plus a one times x. Now, we called that a and b before, just to make it easier. But that's essentially what we just did. So one of the subfunctions is just the, uh, just the scalar 1. f0 of x is 1. In this case, f1 of x is x. That's what we did before. But now we could just generalize it and represent it for any, subset, any set of subfunctions, f0, f1, up through fn. And again, we could write it as this case, the sum of aj times fj of x, so that we would attempt to minimize the sum of the errors, uh, the sum of the squares of the errors of our fitting function with our data, uh, with our y-coordinates. But in this case, of course, f takes on this summation here. And then we would compute the partial derivative then of f with respect to all the ik and get this sort of complicated expression there which we can actually simplify. It's not too difficult to simplify that, and that is what's on the next slide. So if we go to the next slide,
if you do some simplification, you can show that on the left-hand side. What you would end up with is a double summation, but it's not too difficult. Just This is a sum from i goes from 0 to n, with the indexing variable i. On the outside, we have j running from 0 to m. So remember, there's n plus 1 data points and m plus 1 um, design parameters to construct the fitting function. And so what we have here is the j uh, subfunction that's used to find the fitting function evaluated at xj and the kth one all right, at x, xi. All that, uh, again, we're summing up the combinations. I is you know running over all the data points first, and we take the products of, uh, of our two subfunctions there, and then you know correspondingly we're running over every single one of the um, uh, the uh, terms in the fitting function. That has to be equal to this sum, which is i running from zero to n of f k x i y i, and again notice the k here and the k here. So what we're doing is we fix a k, and then we have basically a linear combination uh, for a given k of summing up all the fj of xi's times fk of xi, all that being summed up, all right, um, multiplied times aj. And then the fact that this is running from 0 to m, it may seem strange, but this is basically a linear system of equation. In other words, it's really A times, say, a coefficient matrix A times an unknown vector of A's, the A sub uh, J's, which we don't know, and then a right-hand side, because this is fully determined, right, um, uh, in terms of the data points X, I, Y, I. So, basically, the J, K element of the coefficient matrix we're assuming now that the fj, we would know what the fj's and the fk's are, okay? We, would, we may not know the overall fitting function, but we, we've already decided what fj, uh, what each of these fj of x's is. Like before, with the linear fit, we know that f0 of x is 1 and f1 of x is x. If we were fitting with a quadratic, we would have f0 of x is 1, f1 of x is x, and f2 of x is x squared, you see. So all we have to do is take the products of what, the, what those uh, basis functions, you could call them, fj and fk do at xi, and take their products, and sum all them up for across all those products across um, all the data points, and that gives you fkj. And then the corresponding element on the right-hand side for that, that row is just summing up what the y-coordinate is times that particular index for the row fk at xi. Okay. So these are called the normal equations. It's just setting up a linear system based on these constraints that you get when you set the partial derivative set equal zero with respect to every single design parameter in the least squares function. So let's just make it easy. If you just define fj of x equals x to j, x to the j power, where j runs from 0, 1, 2, and m, the linear system that you're going to get to fit the to, for your fitting function is basically going to have a form where the coefficient matrix it's just x sub i at the j plus k power, summing from 0 to n. And then the corresponding element of the right-hand side b will just be x i to the k power y i. So this is a way that we can do a fitting for any degree polynomial you want. In other words, you'll just decide how large m should be, and then is the larger m is, the larger the linear system is going to be, right? Because you have uh, one of these rows, right, uh, for every one of the j's that you have here, okay? So if m is equal to 3, for example, you're going to have four rows. Now, the number of columns is going to be dependent upon the number of data points you have. So this system will not be a square system necessarily.
Now for the particular way we're choosing to create our fitting function in terms of f of x um, being, remember, the sum j goes from 0 to m of uh, a j x j the coefficient matrix in this case is going to be square so um, now the other particular again that's just because we've constructed it this way um, we've taken monomial terms just x to powers to represent each of these f's so by doing that we won't have a problem uh, getting we won't we will be able to get a square uh, coefficient matrix out of this because as indicated in the previous slide every element can be represented in this way the sum of xi j, uh, to the power j plus k so um, what we've indicated here now is exactly what would that coefficient matrix look like then well, 0, 0, uh, in other words, if we're indexing, right, starting with 0, then if we sum up, if you take j and k to both be 0, then we're summing up xi to the 0 power. That means you're summing up um, uh, ones, right, because everything to the 0 power is 1. Um, so uh, when we sum those up, um, uh, we would get... Uh, in this case, we're going to assume that we'll have n data points, so we'll actually get uh, the value of n there, sitting there. And um, correspondingly, if you set, you know, j um, equal to 0, um, in other words, if we're going across this row, let's go across the row here. So this would be representation of, let's just say, this represents k equals 0 here. And this represents the next one would be k equals one. Well, if k equals zero, the next time we've got k equals zero, j equals zero. This time we've got k equals zero, the j equals one. In this case, it would just be the sum of the xi's. And then in this case, you would have k equals zero, but j equals uh, two, and you'll have squares. You see. And so as you go across, what you've got on the first row is just summing up the xi's, summing up their squares, and then summing up their n powers. And then the same kind of argument would hold up when you fill out the rest of the rows there. But you would have, uh, in this case, uh, m, the system is going to have m plus 1 rows, and you're going to have m plus 1 columns. So this is a square matrix. The right-hand side terms will be just different uh, combinations of summing up different product forms of xi, yi, or up through xi to the m to the yi. So those are just, just what you're going to get for the corresponding right-hand side terms. And, the, and again, what you're solving for is a0 through am. Okay. All right. Um, so you, you are solving this linear system, a, and then this a vector equals this b vector, okay, with the b vector sitting over there, and the a vector is composed of you know, these scalars here that are used to define the fitting function, a0 through am. Again, the linear fit, you only had two, a0 and a1. The quadratic fit, it would be a0, a1, a2. So this is just a general description of what, how to build a linear system. So this would give you an idea of how one might write a code to build the coefficient matrix after you make the decision how big M is. So the whole control that, that determines the size of the system is how big is that M, because that's going to determine the size of the system. If M is equal to 1, you have a 2 by 2 system. If M is equal to... 2, which would be for a quadratic, then you're going to have a 3x3 three three linear system, which again is not that difficult to solve. But as m approaches infinity, though, this matrix will get more and more ill-conditioned because you're going to have some values, you're going to get larger and larger separations in the values uh, with these higher order pro uh, powers there. So as the matrix becomes more ill-conditioned, 
given the fact that we already have errors in the y coordinates, you won't be able to trust the solution that you're getting back. So what does this say about high degree polynomial curve fitting? Probably not a very good idea. Um, you don't want the linear system to become ill-conditioned, and that's going to typically happen for larger and larger m. So you have to keep the degree of the curve fit function, the fitting function, you have to be careful not to choose it to be too large. Again, polynomials will wiggle too much and could sustain some errors, uh, some very harsh errors, if it's, if it's too large of a degree. So um, we're going to review the, a function, a Python function called, called polyfit, which accomplishes a least square fitting on pages 132 and 133. And then we'll go over example 3.12 or 3.12 on pages 140 and 141. Okay. Um, in some cases, with regard to curve fitting, you, you, might, you might have it where some of the data is more reliable or more trustworthy than other parts of the data. And so it might be necessary to actually weight the data points, that maybe some of the data points are more trusted than others. So you can actually change um, the least squares fitting approach where you actually would add um, uh, weights. In this case, you would add factors to these residuals um, where some of these would be the weights, the larger the weight is, perhaps the more emphasis you want to give on getting closer to that particular data point than you do others. If the weight is very small, you don't want to particularly emphasize that data. Maybe you think that data is pretty noisy. Let's not worry about trying to fit it too well. All right? And that should make sense. If, if some of the data could be considered a real outlier, you don't want to have it constraining your fitting function that much. All right? And so this is an approach. This idea of weighted least squares is an approach um, uh, to, to take in that into account, where some of the data is may be known to be more accurate than others. If we look on pages 132 and 133 in the text, you'll see the polyfit Python module, and uh, we're just going to briefly look at it before we um, run a, look at an example and then see a sample code run of it. So the module polyfit is indicated here. Um, you would pass uh, as indicated, the x, y, the x coordinate data, the y coordinate data, and plus the um, degree of the uh, polynomial m. And again, you know, not taking it too large uh, or the best possible fit. Um, that function returns the coefficients of the polynomial that fits that particular data. Or you're assuming the um, subfunctions, the f sub j's in this case, are just powers. Uh, subsequent powers of x. Um, you can get the um, standard deviation reflecting the spread, the error between the fitting function and the y data by calling the standard D, DEV function uh, as a way of measuring the, the corresponding error of the fit. So as we scroll down and um, see the specific uh, declarations needed for polyfit uh, uh, using the uh, initialization, the zeros function available, uh, and then basically setting up the um, coefficient matrix um, for the linear system, A equals B, the corresponding right-hand side. But uh, if we scroll down a little bit more, you can see where the actual definition Aij is going to be uh, equal to Si plus J. Um, again, where you're looking at different powers of, uh, of the uh, uh, x coordinates uh, being multiplied by each other. And um, we're going to return uh, the solution by using pivoting. Pivoting might be necessary. The matrix won't necessarily be diagonally dominant. So um, we'll use pivoting by using our Gauss pivot function, and that would return the solution. Um, 
Next is the definition for the declaration of the standard deviation function, standard deviation function so that you could, again, get a single value to reflect the error and the fit, and that will return the sigma function for you. If we um, move a little bit farther along into the text on pages 140 and 141, um, you'll see that uh, there's an example uh, example 3.12 to use the polyfit function uh, to fit the data and determine the M that best fits in the least square sense. So here's an attempt to try to figure out what M produces the best um, possible fit the, in terms of the degree of the polynomial. Um, you'll see the Python code to initialize the data. Um, X data, Y data, and then we're using a try block within the while loop um, to uh, compute the coefficients necessary for that particular curve fit in a least square sense with of a degree m, and print those coefficients, um, and we would keep doing that until we uh, it's it's. Um, until we would get uh, a particular error in the fit uh, in terms of the um, uh, the, that we would not be able to uh, continue that, that fit. And we'll see that if we just look at an example of the results, um, again, until we hit an ex, an, a syntax error in the break, uh, degree, uh, if the degree is 1, We'll start off with m equal to 1. Those are the coefficients for that best fit line. Standard deviation is 0.51. If we go to a quadratic for the data, um, that's the par parameters to specify that in terms of the coefficients on um, the x squared, the x, and the, one, and the, um, the, the, the scalar term. Standard deviation drops, and it goes up to 3. And um, and then finally, um, it halts. Um, the uh, again each time the user is, is selecting the degree of the polynomial, um, and if as long as there's a particular value there. Uh, the try block continues. The minute um, the user gives anything that's not going to be uh, a pr an appropriate value for m, um, the uh, this, there'll be a syntax error caught for that parameter and it'll break it. So if you just hit the re hit a space or hit a return without protecting an integer, it would stop, and that's exactly what happens here. And we'll illustrate that in a minute. Um, and then here's just a Using you know Matplotlib, you could then again take the data that you got back from the function. Um, in other words, the when the polyfit uh, uses a third-degree polynomial. Here are the um, coefficients that you would need to construct it. Um, but uh, you'll notice that that the standard deviation here for the uh, third degree polynomial is a little bit larger than the um, standard deviation for the quadratic polynomial. So it turns out this is actually the best fit is with the quadratic. And again, um, uh, in terms of the order of the coefficients, the a zeros, excuse me, the first one is the scalar term. The second one would be the coefficient on the x. The next one will be the co coefficient on x squared. I think I had it backwards just a second ago. So they're, they're ordered if you go back to the definition of how we constructed the fitting function. It's always a0 plus a1 times x plus a2 times x squared and so forth, where we're assuming the fj's are just increasing powers of x. Right. So that's why you'll see the coefficients coming out here basically define this function where we just truncate to, say, four decimal points.
And so this picture illustrates that quadratic fitting the data, where of course it doesn't necessarily go through all the data points, but it's a really, really good uh, choice for the fitting function. So here we have the Python um, script file that essentially would do the same example that we were doing uh, in the textbook 3.12, and I will provide uh, certainly polyfit.py as well as this file, example3 underscore 12.py for you on Blackboard, so it'll be available for you to download and to use. Um, just uh, briefly uh, reviewing the, the example again, the creation of the X data and the Y data uh, from uh, the input list into the array function from NumPy, definitely using NumPy, and we're going to um, use the polyfit module and, uh, and matplotlib or imported as PyLab for all the graphing. We're going to illustrate how the fitting is done um, and I'll show you how we're doing that um, in the code. But basically, um, again, we ask the user for the degree of the polynomial we want to start off with and then call the polyfit function to get the coefficients. And so once we have the coefficients, we know what the fitting function looks like. Um, because we're assuming it's based on powers of increasing powers of x. And so that's exactly what we're doing here in this for loop is we're going to have to evaluate the polynomial at all the x coordinates and store that into the array, say, ys. And so you can see where we're taking the coefficient uh, for the very first term, say, a0. That would be a coef is in this array coefficient, 0. And then we would take the very first x coordinate and raise it to um, the subsequent power of x as we went across um, uh, all the uh, terms in the fitting function, remember, depending upon um, the size of m. And that's why we let the i run from uh, 0 up through the range uh, of m up to but not including m plus 1. So, zero, so i will run from 0 to m. And uh, so we generate all the y values that we would get back uh, when we evaluate our fitting function at x and see how that compares to the true y data uh, that really matches the x coordinates uh, that was given to us. And so we're just going to plot the, uh, the fitting function here, x data versus ys, and then the original data and see what they look like. So um, we'll go ahead and run that, um, or we'll go ahead and run the code. Again, I have the path to the interpreter specified in the file, so I can just run the code. It's going to start asking for the degree of polynomial. We'll start off with one, so we get the coefficients of the line. There is the, so um, the scalar term, and this is the coefficient on the x the figure in very carefully for you. The standard deviation is 0.5112 and there it is. And you can see that is a line trying to fit the data. Um, and you can see clearly there's some errors in some places and it's a better fit in others. Definitely not interpolation but we're actually able to fit it. Uh, if I close the window it'll uh, end that particular iteration of the try loop and then come back and ask for the next one. Um, we'll go ahead and select 2 for the quadratic fit. The standard deviation drops to 0 0.3109. It's got to then take those coefficients, build the fitting function, which is a quadratic, and now you can definitely see there's curvature here, and now we're fitting the data with a quadratic, and um, the error is overall a little bit better. Yes, there's still some errors there, but for most of the data, uh, we're getting a better fit. Um, close this off and let's try to go one more time to three um, and we can see the standard deviation increased a little bit so the quadratic is the best fit um, but let's see what the graph looks like anyway and if we see what the graph um, I mean there's a little bit more error here than there was before it's still a pretty good fit but it's slightly worse than the quadratic so hence in solving this particular problem the better fit is with the quadratic Having visualization of it is very nice, but again, the advantage of the standard deviation function is we can get a numerical score to represent 
how much spread we're getting, how much air there is across the interval. And of course, after I've killed that window off, um, it will ask for another degree of polynomial. If I hit a space bar, the syntax error exception will come in because there won't be a value for M for, the, um, for that particular call to polyfit. And so the code completely exits. And just finishing up again, remember um, we, uh, before we did the example, we talked about the fact that if you have information about the quality of the data, you could use what we would call a weighted least squares fit, where you're actually providing a weight uh, on the different data, where the, the larger those weights are, the more trusted the value is, and you want the fit to be better at those points than perhaps other points. And then you would go in and then adjust, for example, in the case of linear regression, this is a representation of weighted linear regression, where you'll just have these weight terms in there for the minimization problem. And so it turns out the solution looks like this. Um, we change the, the medians, uh, the mean values here to be hat values, y hat and x hat, where you can see they're weighted, these weights are applied to the um, to the uh, to each term in the summations as well as norm and they're normalized they're divided out in the bottom so the solution is slightly different but what essentially it's going to do is to better it's going to guarantee that your fit is best at certain data points that correspond to the largest weights